Let's go. Hi, welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefings. I'm Mark Owen, and each week I invite a panel of business experts to review the morning newspapers, find out what's happened in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors. Finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline? But before I start, I always like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazelwood's Accountants and Business Advisors, and we really couldn't do the show without them or our advertisers. Okay, let's meet the panel. Today we've got Rupert Badell. He is the CEO and general manager of Fast Host. The company manages more than 1.1 million domains and hosts more than 10,000 servers across the UK data centers. Yeah, the business has a turnover of 42 million, 250 staff, and they recently announced that they are the first tenants of Gloucester's 107 million pound digital forum development taking the 19,000 square feet of office space, basically a whole block. Rupert has just joined the company a couple of months ago, so we'll find out how it's all going and all about the movement and stuff like this. Okay, we've got Enzo Moro, CEO of Mortgage Brain. The company has 100 staff covering the UK with a majority based in Gloucester on Brunswick Road, Work Road. Turnover is 6 million quid. Inflation has just gone down, as we all know, around 1.7%. So we'll find out how that's going to affect the mortgage market and most importantly, the housing market as well. Plus, he's got some news himself that he was uh, making this week in this week's punchline. We got Peter Mars. He's a CME, sorry, MD at Forge Motorsport UK and Forge Engineering. The company is 54 staff, Bristol Road HQ. There's five in Taiwan as well. Turnover is 5.5 million. Now, it was down 20% from last year, and it is a tough business to be in as the company battles rising costs, stiff competition. So we find out about Mitt Bill about that and also what's his cunning plan for the future. And finally, last not least, we've got Joe Sutherland. She's the CEO and founder of Charlie's Community Support for anyone affected by cancer, offering free holistic therapies, uh, therapists and support for them and their families. Joe was diagnosed with cancer herself and it changes who you are. It affects your mind, your body, your soul. But she found that holistic therapies help so much that she retrained as a holistic therapist and launched Charlie's back in 2010, so 10th anniversary this year as well. Congratulations. Now, over the years, she has helped thousands and thousands of people, so we'll find out more about the amazing work that she does. Okay, let's have a quick look at the newspapers. Okay, let's see what's making the headlines, courtesy of the BBC. Financial Times, Hamas mastermind of 7th of October attacks killed in Gaza, says Israel. The Daily Telegraph, Israel kills, kills Hamas leader. The Guardian, mastermind of Hamas attacks on Israel is killed by IDF troops. The Times, Hamas leader is killed in chance shelling by Israel. The Metro, Liam's final tragic hours. The Daily Star, our kind, funny and brave soul. The Mirror, our kind, funny, brave soul. It's a snap. Do they know each other? The, the Daily Mail. Record label dumped Liam before fatal drugs binge. The Sun, we love you, brother, says the uh, One Direction rest of the band. The I, UK Public Service cuts in budget. Labour ministers accused number 10 of complacency. The Daily Express, pension cash in panic as Labour budget tax rises. OK, that is what's all over the headlines. If I can find my little cursor. So, OK, let's get the gang back. Right, let's start with you, Joe. What have you picked out for the papers, please? Uh, so the first thing that I picked out was to talk about the MP Kim Ledbetter, who has wrote to the Archbishop of Canterbury about the rule in assisted dying. Um, and she's opposed against it, that she doesn't agree with it. And I think it's a subject that we probably need to talk about a bit more. I think we don't talk about dying until we're faced with an illness or faced with death. And I think it's a subject that we should cover at much younger age. Even our children should talk about death and dying because it's inevitable. It's something we can't get away from. However, I feel quite torn on the debate of changing the law. Um I meet people who suffer and I think if they had the choice to end their life early, they would possibly take that. However, I also meet people who are given a, a time scale of death and they they far exceed that. You know, you can give them a diagnosis of you might survive the next four years and they go on to live another 10 years. 
And you think if that person had ended their life early, you know, it's not quite going to pan out. And I just think it's a really interesting subject and I'm very torn on it. You know, nobody wants to watch a family member suffer. Um, but also, you know, we hold out hope that there will be a miracle and sometimes there is. I mean, my brother passed away from cancer. I was with him, actually. And I know for a fact that he would have gone for it. Uh, you know, he talked about committing suicide and things like this for quite some time. Uh, and you're right. I mean, he, but they wouldn't know that they'd finished their lives earlier, if you know, in a perverse kind of way. It, it really is a difficult subject to to sort of grapple, isn't it? I wouldn't know which way I'd swing in the House of Lords of it or House of Commons if it was me. Just very quickly, what about the rest of the panel? Rupert, you got a view on it? Quick. Well, that's a tough one. No, I've I've gone with quite frivolous stories myself this morning, staying away from the bad news. So, uh, no, it's not, uh, not something I've got a strong view on. OK, no worries at all. Pete, have you got a view on it at all? I think it be the, should be the choice of the individual. I totally, uh, I totally understand Joe's point. Um, uh, but I haven't seen um, my father and all sort of wasted away, becoming skeletal um, and just unable to do anything. I think it would... Uh, he would have chosen it, I'm sure. And I, I think it should be down to choice. Enzo, very quick. Sister uh, Diane. I'm, I'm not sure uh, which way I'd like to vote on that one, really. No, no, it's a it's a real difficult one. Joe, what else have you got for us? Thank you, Pamela. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is about the councillor's wife that's been held accountable for her actions for stirring racial hatred um, over social media. Um, which is absolutely correct. And I think there needs to be more of a lockdown on social media by people spreading hatred and gaining followers. It's apt, I feel it's got completely out of control. Um, and I think that it's right that she was sentenced and she's been put away into jail. And I hopefully it's an example of what people could expect if they spread racial hatred online. They should also have the same rules as, as print media or broadcast media. So it's all about libel, stuff like that. You can't just say what you bloody want to say. Thanks so much for that, Joe. OK, let's go over to you, uh, Pete. What have you picked out for us, please? Um, I think I've got sort of two contrasting ones. Uh, I've got the Derg in the uh, it was Western Daily. It was uh, Deliveroo, Hales Healthy UK group, uh, Growth, um, upper half of 130 million. Um, growth is growing 5% year on year, which I'm not sure what that says about our sort of, it says healthy growth. I'm not sure what it says about healthy eating. Um, probably the convenience of getting stuff delivered to your door. But then the counterpoint was uh, in the mail was, I think it's the mail was um, Ben Nestle, Kit Kat, holding back price rises as they're seeing consumer confidence fall. Um, so yeah, two sort of contrasting points, you know, you've just seen Kit Kat and Stuff in your shelves in the high streets. Um, so interesting counterpoints, I thought, with, with where the economy is and perhaps the convenience of eating at home. It's funny, isn't it? I don't ever have anything from delivery. It just don't, doesn't, but you know, my daughter will order, my daughter will order a McDonald's takeaway, you know, no, I and, uh, I, and I think, well, I live in Westbury on Severn, so we've barely got the internet, so there's no way they're driving out to us. <laughs> OK, thanks so much for that, Pete. Rupert, let's go over to you. What have you picked out for the papers, please? So as I mentioned, I've, I've stayed away. I find the, the headlines uh, all too depressing at the moment uh, with what's going on in the Middle East and Liam Payne and so on. So, so my three stories, I've started with um, a story about work, and this is one close to my heart, uh, having, having started recently at Fast Hosts. Uh, so it's about the things that employees hate the most. Um, and they've listed three things, rude managers, and I can certainly subscribe to that, uh, poor technology, um, and, and in particular, meetings. Um, so this is one of the top three things that people hate. Um, and actually, it talks about, you know, two business leaders, Elon Musk, who, who doesn't do meetings. He, he refuses to meet with anybody in his organization, apparently. Um, and Jeff Bezos, who will only do a meeting if two pizzas will feed everybody in the meeting. So he uh, he refuses to meet with, with large groups of people, which was a bit of a Steve Jobs thing as well. He was never that keen on meetings. He'd rather just tell people what to do and, and have them get on with it. Um, my view on this one, uh, look, they're essential. I'm a big fan. Uh, I was talking about it um, when we were at the forum the other week about getting people back into the office. I think it's a, you know, a very efficient and, and energizing way to work. Um, I do hate long meetings. Uh, people putting in a meeting for an hour and then, you know, you're done after 20 minutes and then everybody continues to talk for the next 40 minutes. So um, one of the rules we have at Fast Host going forward is nothing more than 30 minutes. Um, it's my belief that every meeting can be resolved inside 20, 25 minutes. 
then you've got time for a week before you go to the next one. So, uh, so I'm a big, big proponent of that. Um, my second story is uh, is about the internet, and uh, it was a, a story uh, talking about Alexa and some of the things that it's been churning out, uh, supposedly the truth, uh, which is absolute nonsense, complete lies, um, and including, which I thought was quite funny, that the Northern Lights were uh, created by a research facility in Alaska, and actually not a uh, not a planetary phenomenon. Um, and it just, it, it, it reminded me of this concern that, that we have at the moment around AI and how much AI is, is scraping stuff off the internet and then being mm. repurposed and regurgitated. And where does that take you in the long term? Well, we've got organizations using AI to write content constantly. And it's just snowballing this sort of internetification of things where it's just the same old content being repeated, 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 repeated uh, in an exponential fashion. And it just degrades the internet. Um, and uh, when you've got an organization like Amazon not fact-checking um, on a basic level, then, then we're in trouble. I, I totally agree. We don't use AI in any of our writing. I keep being asked all the time, you know, can Punchline do that? We'll save you time, we'll save you money, blah, blah, blah. But no, no, you've got to be, you know, creative contact yourself. Uh, and you're right, it's just spurring out this stuff, uh, especially on Facebook as well. And again, it goes back to that liability we're talking about and that sort of hatred and things. Uh, oh, thanks ever so much for that, Rupert. But Enzo, great to have you on the show again, as always. What have you picked out for us, please? Morning, Mark. Uh, well, when we were prepping earlier and you asked me about my stories, the first one I mentioned was Netflix. And you sort of rolled your eyes as if to say, that doesn't sound very interesting. But um, what fascinates me is that uh, their subscriptions are up uh, greater than expected. Um, for a company that started off as a, a DVD postal service, and then a uh, you know, reported quarterly revenue was £9.9 .9 billion, pounds. Oh. Uh, that's going some but it just gets it also makes me think I don't know how much you guys spend a month on TV subscriptions but I haven't added mine up and I'm wondering how much I do pay a month for all these different um, channels that uh, I want to watch so which ones do you have though go on, go on then let's have a look which ones you haven't got Enzo very quickly got Netflix got I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say, but, you know, I've got Sky, I've got, uh, you know, BBC, ITV, the, the, the typical one, Netflix, Prime, Apple, uh, Paramount. No. A couple of sports ones. Make sure I can watch so my bit of football playing. You're talking, I would imagine that's kind of like 60, 70 quid a month just on, on, on that, mate, perhaps. I reckon I that's all time. More I don't understand that. That's over 100 quid. Yeah, that's over 100. We should have time to watch any of this stuff. I'm working so much. Obviously, you've got a good crew there. Okay. Enzo, <laughs> one, one, one more. What else? And I didn't roll my eyes. So I just built that way. Yeah, you did. Um, the, the, the next one's um, an article in the, uh, the Times, the, the headline, FA accused of hypocrisy over failure to appoint English national manager. So they're, they're going on about uh, the appointment of Thomas Tuchel, who's a German who's now in charge of the English football team. Uh, and um, I just wondered, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it's, I think he's a fantastic manager, but I'm not sure it sits right with me that you have a German managing an English, uh, the English national team. I, I don't know what others' uh, opinions are. I, I, I've got a view on this one, Enzo, if, you, if I chime in. I, I honestly don't think anyone will care uh, in a month's time uh, or when we get into the fixtures. I, I grew up in Ireland and we had Jack Charlton in the 80s and he's revered, he's held up as a god. And it was the same sort of thing when we appointed him. It was the first non-Irish manager and particularly an English manager coming over to manage Ireland. Uh, you know, there was some... Uh, tissue rejection, I think, at that point. He has been the most successful manager we've ever had and uh, no one would have changed him for the world. And I think that that's, I think I think if he starts winning in January, no one's going to care. Yeah, I totally agree. And by the way, I just want to add that I actually met Jack Charlton in a lift here in Gloucester. Well, there we go, shared a lift with him. And uh, he was very funny, very funny man. And he swore all the time. F this, F that. I don't know about that, honestly. Anyway, right. Thank you ever so much, gang. And let's go over to you, Joe. Um, please, I'd love to know more about Charlie's. It's a charity. It's a small charity. It's been going for 10 years. Um, yeah, can, so um, 
Charlie started back in 2014 and it started just as a very small group that came together to give free support to people affected by cancer. After my diagnosis, I was disappointed at the lack of support that was around. Um, not from the medical side, that was fine. It was more of the emotional side afterwards. Um, I have a friend who's a cancer specialist nurse and she agreed that the nurses and consultants don't get time to do what we call the TLC of holding somebody's hand, making sure that they're okay. Um, and I do believe that the holistic therapies changed me, changed my life, um, sent it in a different direction. And all I wanted to do was help other people. So friends and family would say, can you give Reiki to people for free? Yep, yeah, no problem. Started traveling around the county, doing a part-time job at the same time. And thought that there's got to be something in this. I had no idea what I'm doing. I've got no business acumen. I had no aspirations of owning anything or being a CEO or even a charity in mind. I just wanted to do something nice for people. And it just snowballed from there. And um, yeah, it's phenomenal how it's changed over 10 years. I mean, it's so difficult running a charity now, you know, the the to, to finance it, to get all the money, to get the volunteers, you know, when things get tight as they are now, well, what are the sort of financial situation at the moment, if you don't mind me asking, Joe? No, it's it's really funny because you say that. However, we don't, as a charity, we don't live beyond our means. Um, we apply for funding so that we can run specialised services. We are so lucky with the people that we support that want to give back to us. And we apply for all the same funding grants or the, the other charities do. Um, we do OK because we are small. We have only four staff. We are. I'm the only full time staff. I've got three part time staff. So we're not salary heavy and we've got 60 volunteers. Now, without the volunteers, by no means would we be able to operate across the county. And that's what we rely on. But, yeah, we want more funding so that we can extend our services. We've started to spread out across the county through Sirencester, Cinderford and Newant and Cheltenham. And we need to go to Letchlade. We need to go to Dursley. We need to go to Tetbury. So, yeah, we need more funding so that we can go into the smaller communities so that we can just support more people. It's such a wide county and quite, you know, geographically, it's quite hard to get across. Uh, you know, I, I've done it myself is loads and loads of Huge. And it first started back in 2018 when I met a lovely lady called Maddie. And she came to us for support for when she was going through breast cancer. And she lived in the Forest of Dean. Now, traveling over from the Forest of Dean can take 45 minutes to an hour. And when you're unwell, Come in somewhere like here to get some therapy to relax when you've spent 45 minutes in a car. It's just not doable and it's not what you want to do when you feel sick all the time. So Maddie had the idea that we would set up um, in the Forest of Dean on her doorstep where she lived. So Maddie set up my first satellite, which was absolutely amazing. And that was back in 2018. And now we've got five satellites across the county. No, oh, okay, fantastic. Well, keep us posted. We're uh, here at Bunchline. We'd definitely love to help you spread the word. Char uh, I'd nearly call you Charlie then, Joe. Why did you call it Charlie's, by the way? Uh, so it's after my granddad who passed away from cancer when I was 11. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, let's go to you, Pete. We talked before, you and I, on a couple of times we've come on the show, and, on, and I really appreciate your, your honesty because, you know, the, the 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 business itself, you know, you you've said before it's tough. Just tell us very quickly about Forge Motorsport uh, and the kind of stuff that you do, because I know and other people might not. Yeah, so we started in '83, set up with a by the family, my mum and dad, my aunt and my uncle, just engineering business, mm -hmm. making uh, making parts for Bird's Eye Wars and ICI fibers back in the day. For those people that are old enough to remember them, up in Brockworth. Um, um, in 1996, we started making a range of aftermarket performance parts, basically bits that make cars sound a bit noisier and go a bit faster. Um, and that that's, sort of continues to this day. Um, 2022, I, I think with um, you know fuel costs, eating costs, just general cost of living, um, our products are not essential. They are aspirational. And I, we've seen a, a big change in the market with folks rightly needing to pay their fuel bills, heat their houses, look after their kids, feed, feed the kids. Uh, and our parts become not necessary. Um, 
our particular demographic, I would say, are um, anything from uh, young lads living at home um, to sort of married couples. Uh, and again, that um, that demographic's not spending money. There's certainly a prestige market up in the likes of Porsche and Jaguar, um, which almost appears to us recession-proof. Unfortunately, um, we're not in that market. So we've had to diversify back into traditional engineering, um, looking back for work with, with regards to the MOD, um, also doing some private label work for other um, car manufacturers. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really, really tough. We've Since we last spoke, we had 54 staff and we've still got them. We've got an amazing group of people that I'm, I'm privileged to work with. Um, they've supported us through, you know, we've held uh, pay rises back and we've, we've had to cut all overtime and everybody's stayed. Everybody's uh, working really, really hard. Uh, we managed to give a small uh, 2.5% rise in August, um, which everybody was very grateful for. But we just, we people said, what are you going to do? We've got a recovery plan in which basically is to try and um, bring in more subcontract work whilst pushing very, very hard our retail sales to the internet. Uh, and when people say, what you've got to do, we say we've got a recovery plan in place and we've got to keep on going because we've got no choice. The, the choice there's no choice to um, to re- reduce staff members. I um, We have a very modest aspiration and that is we're not going to make a profit this year. We're going to make a huge loss. But if at the end of the year, we've still got 54 people, I'll take that. Um, we'll do budgets for next year. We'll have a slightly aspirational one to to make some kind of profit. But with the year we've had, if we broke even, that would be massive for us now. Uh, so it's day by day. Cash, uh, we've got orders in, but cash flow is killing us. It's, it's, it's the thing that kills all businesses, isn't it? Cash flow. Yeah. Luckily, we, we're pretty good with the banks right now. Um, but as, as I was told by one of our financial advisors, uh, the days of business relationships with bank managers, whilst they're uh, essential, seem to have gone. And um, it would seem that, um, to use an old uh, David Williams um, quotation, if the computer says no um, and the AI says no, they'll, the banks will pull your funding. So it's tough, but we'll get there. We've got no choice. It's the amount of people that say they can't see the bank manager, the bank manager doesn't know them, they don't understand the business. You know, surely if a bank actually kept the bloody bank managers you know it, the, it, i think it's so frustrating isn't it you know yeah, when we, i was chair of the fsb it was it was bad but it's got even worse yeah we got two good bank managers they know us intimately um but uh and they they, they do all they can to support us but i think it, it always has to go up the chain uh and 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 i'm not sure that chain is is actually human i, I, I do believe that I mean, i'm sure rupert will be able to I think it's. Just, I'm not sure if it's AI, but if uh, if if you know what they can't see is our orders um, that sit unfulfilled right now. Um, but yeah, it's it, the, the decision people, is not. Are, are people paying you on time, Pete? Well, you we're, know, very, said... we're, we're very lucky. I've been in business as long as we have been. Uh, most of our, um, our our revenue comes through retail. Uh, uh, sorry, no. Well, most of our revenue does come through our dealers, and our dealers are established of over twenty years. Um, and we we went out to the to, to our customer base and said, look, we're really struggling for cash flow, and we've got fifty percent of those dealers are now paying us in fifteen days. They want to support us. Um, we've gone out to suppliers and we've told them this. I think the key thing in all this is the relationships you build with your dealers and your suppliers. As a as a as a manufacturer, the last thing I I, I want to do is be putting somebody on stop because they can't pay. It's crucial that we have communication. So we went out to our suppliers, and again, our top suppliers extended our our, uh, our credit to sixty days, so we can manage our cash. So important that the businesses um, don't bottle it up, don't feel embarrassed, um, and, and talk openly. Because I, there's nothing I'd like to do is sit in, sit in here with you guys and say, you, you know, um, we're absolutely killing it. We're making massive profits. What we need to do is is remember this feeling, remember how bad it is, remember how the staff feel. And uh, make sure we're working on all our relationships because without our, 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 uh, the people we work with, we're nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, just just keep it all open, keep and keep going. Well, just keep battling there, Pete. And I take my hat off to you. I was wearing a hat. Take my hat off to you, especially the way you look after your staff. Well, I bet you pound to a penny you don't pay yourself sometimes as well, because that's what's happened to me in the past. Yeah. You know, that's for another conversation. Okay. Yeah. 
Thanks ever so much for being so honest. Okay, Enzo, let's go over to you. Look, hey, we, we talk on a regular basis uh, uh, about the mortgage market, about the housing market. The housing market gets a cold. We all get a cold. So what's it like out there, Enzo, for mortgages at the moment? And can you see them coming down? Well, um, you know, 2024 has seen a lot of uh, uh, improvement over 23. Uh, the banks, uh, the lenders that have uh, are offering deals have had more confidence uh, in the economy. And we've seen rates reduce, the deals that are available with lenders reduce over the, uh, you know, the months leading into 2024. Um the uh, you know the the boost we had uh, um, was it last month or the month before we had the Bank of England drop the base rate uh, for the first time in a in a few years by a quarter of a percent. So bank base is now at five percent. Um, good news, I think you were going to mention about inflation. So inflation's down to one point seven percent. European Central Bank announced uh, a quarter of a percent drop in the um, the bank rate, and they're down to three um, percent now. Um, I don't think we'll see another change before the, the budget, but then the budgets are only at the end of this month. Um, but I'm confident that we'll see the Bank of England drop its rates further over the next twelve months. And how is the housing market? How is the you know how is business with you? You know, um, mortgages going through. Are they still flying. Yeah, uh, yeah. We've had a, a, a you know a much stronger twenty twenty four than twenty three, uh, and we've seen a, a, a you know a growth in numbers. Uh, as a as a mortgage broking business, we're fortunate in that we work with national developers and. Um, They've uh, they've been able to maintain sales, not at the levels of two years ago, but, um, you know, improving levels of sales. And we support uh, the mortgages for clients that are buying those new built homes. Um, so we've seen. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got a question just on that after. Yeah, well, we've seen growth both in the uh, new build market space and the uh, what we call the old build market space as well. Okay. Go on then, uh, Pete. What would you just what would you just, just, a, just a really quick one, Enzo? So I, I remember obviously we can all remember the banks and banking collapse. I've got three or four lads who work here. Um, one particularly young man works uh, lives in Bristol. Um, so keen to get on the housing ladder. Him and his what his girlfriend both work. He's currently paying twelve hundred pounds a month in uh in, in rental fees. Um, been doing it for 10 years. And and you know, my very simplistic sort of um approach is what is it with mortgage lenders, banks that can't see, you know, this guy needs 20 grand as a deposit. He's trying to pay 1300 quid traveling from Bristol. His opportunity to save is limited. Surely, you, you know, if you, if you, if you've got 10 years of paying 1300 quid a month, you've got proven track history of the capability of being able to pay your mortgage. A mortgage on a property you'd like around Bristol would be about 900 quid. I just wondered if you, if you, if you think there'll ever be sort of this, I wouldn't call it compassionate, but a, a change in lending that allows these guys uh, who are struggling to save to uh, to get on the, uh, on the on the housing ladder. It, it is tough, uh, especially for first time buyers, and I, I um, you know, I, I sympathise. But uh, affordability is uh, is a challenge. But lenders are looking at ways in which they can I- improve that. One lender, uh, I think it was the Skipton Building Society, announced over the last 12 months that they would look at first-time buyers that have a, a rental track record. And if they showed that, uh, in like your lad's example, they were paying more rent than mortgage, they would increase their income multiple and allow right. them to borrow a little bit more. And there are, there are you know, a number of schemes, uh, a couple in the new build uh, market space where... Uh, there's some support for deposit and then for affordability on what people can borrow. So it's worth um, plugging uh, mortgage brokers, get, you know, yeah. get guys to go yeah. and see brokers that have access to the different lenders in the marketplace and the different criteria available yeah. um, just to see what options are out there. Brilliant. Thank okay. you. Get her to go to the mortgage brain. That's the thing, Pete. Okay. Thanks ever so much for that. Uh, Rupert, Rupert, uh, great to have you on the show. Fast Host. Now, obviously, this is a company that's based on Southgate Street. I don't know if anybody knows it. It's all 
tucked in there. We've all sort of driven past it for a long time. You joined the company a couple of months ago. Wow, we it's there's a lot going on, isn't it? Tell us about the move, please, to to the forum. There is a lot going on. It's uh, I, I feel like I've joined at a very a very good time. Um, so yeah, it's uh, Fastos has been on Southgate Street as you mentioned for I think twenty six years. Um, if you don't know the history of Fastos, it's definitely worth having a look. Um, started by a seventeen year old Andrew Michael in nineteen ninety eight. Um, I think he borrowed money from his mother's credit card to put in a, a fast internet line and uh, basically decided that. He could offer hosting space to uh, to anybody for A level projects for small businesses, uh, and that this was going to be a thing. Now, bear in mind, this was 1998; the internet was still pretty uh, embryonic. Uh, fast forward to 2006, he sold the company for I think 61 million, uh, which was you know a mental note for me. I need to pay more attention to my kids' A level projects. Uh, it could make me a billionaire. Um, and yeah, it's uh, the company's sort of gone on from then, and it's it's still relatively in its in its same form. Um, so we've been on Southgate Street. You might have missed it. It's it's a sort of entrance between the vape shop and the pizza shop. Um, so not not um, particularly fancy surroundings. However, that's all about to change. Uh, so we are the first tenants into the digital forum in the centre of town. Uh, Mark and I were lucky enough to have a, a wander around last week. I had another one yesterday to look at the fast host uh, area. Particularly, we're taking four floors of uh, of the uh, Cathedral View Number no. Two. I think it's called. Um, but it's it's going to be an absolute game changer. It's it's you can see already it's starting to take shape. Um, just the light, the space, the areas. It's it's absolutely cutting edge in terms of how we're, we're kitting it out. There's incredible excitement at Fast House moving into this space, and I hope it's uh, more incentive to get people back into the office on a more regular basis. Uh, I don't think we could be more conveniently placed within Gloucester. It's right beside the bus and train station. Uh, all the facilities you need on your doorstep, gym. We've got a terrace bar upstairs on the fourth floor uh, that our office leads into so um i can't think of too much more motivation to get people back into the office so so really really looking forward to that and we all know that you're only going to have meetings for half an hour anyway yes well you see if you've got a lovely cocktail bar next door then you don't want to be stuck in an hour-long meeting when people are sitting out in the sunshine having a nice a nice beer on a friday evening you know it's uh you've got to prioritize right no, that's exactly right. And I tell you what, guys, when we we were lucky enough to show around, and Rupert has kindly offered me to go around and have a look at his new premises uh, when it moves forward a little bit more as well. So I'm looking forward to that, Rupert. If that offer still stands, uh, but honestly, that terrace on top of that hotel, overlooking you know the the sort of uh, King Square and things, and be able to see a wonderful cathedral in the distance, it really is fantastic, isn't it? It's it's going to be a game changer for the city. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can see it all taking shape, not just the building, but, you know, the surrounding area. The redevelopment is starting to, I think, pay dividends. Yeah, I've been spending a lot of time walking around Gloucester the last couple of weeks getting to know it. I don't know Gloucester. It's, uh, I live in, in, in London at weekends, but I'm spending my weeks in Gloucester now. Um, but it's heartening to see. And I think actually, you know, the docks has already had a huge amount of, of redevelopment and, and looked very smart and shiny. I think if you if you do it in the town centre now as well, you know, ideally, it gives the whole place a, a bit of a lift. Um, yeah. And it, uh, yeah. And 250 members of staff all running around the city. It can't be a bad thing. Then you've got the university coming along. And that takes you the Thirsty Pine Tree that's opened up on Brunswick Road, by the way. All that lovely Belgian beer really is quite special. Uh, I was talking to the owner. They've just had a, a big party of people booked there as well for Christmas party. So get a chance to go down there. Enzo, maybe you guys or your Christmas party there as well. Anyway, moving, moving on, he cheekily says. Uh, let's go to the newspapers. Uh, sorry, pick up the punchlines. We've only got a few minutes late, so we'll have to rattle, rattle through them. I'm going to throw a curveball to start with you, Enzo. What are you going to pick out the, from the uh, punchlines, please? Well, it's a shame you're in a rush because I wanted to... Uh get you to tell us about test drive mirror signal omg it was fantastic yeah i drove an mg uh the uh, bayless down on cole avenue I, uh, I i rocked up wearing the wrong pair of boots by the way which you should never do test driving a car i don't drive an automatic i drive a battered old diesel hyundai so to take this car out that goes from uh, not to 60 in 3.2 seconds, uh, three, yeah, 3.2 seconds is pretty astounding. Uh, he didn't tell me about the little red button that you could push that goes even faster. Uh, and uh, it was, it was, uh, it was a real, real wow moment, uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, just taking out the 
taking it out the driveway the, you know for for mg is a bit of a slope as well and uh it's a wonderful car to drive and it has a soft top oh if i if i had a spare 56 grand it'd be mine I, i'm not sure i'd get the golf clubs in the back of the boot but uh but uh, the wife could take out you know i could uh, maybe have them there i don't know anyway beautiful car thanks for me mentioning that enzo that's right. I'm just wondering whether Pete can tell you he's got a, a device that can make it sound nice as well. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's an EV made in China. <laughs> so, like that. Pete, okay, we're going to go over to you now. What have you picked up for the papers, please? Well, uh, it's, for um, Punchline. What am I on about? For punchline. Um, fantastic uh, Gloucester based company, ProCook. Um, been following them for a long time. Amazing facility down the end, uh, at the end of the Bristol Road. Uh, just with us struggling. Just proud to see a Gloucester company. What does it say here? 8.8% uh, in Q2, 17 million. Um, just opened up uh, 10 new stores. Wow, fantastic. Long, you know, it's great to see a local business doing really, really well. Um, employing, yeah. you know, hundreds of Gloucester people. Fantastic. Yeah, real nice guy as well, Daniel O'Neill. Yeah. He's been on the show lots of times as well. Okay, let's go over to you, Rupert. What have you picked out from Punchline, please? Uh, so I've gone with a, a story that kind of harks back to my career past. I worked in financial services for most of my career uh, and often do the kind of marketing and PR. Uh, and it's the story about St. James's Place uh, reporting, uh, I think, record profits or 20% year on year growth, uh, something like 4.4 billion uh, under management, which is an incredible number. But what's amazing about this story is probably the last 10 years, St. James's Place has been the, the punch bag for bad PR in financial services. Um, and particularly that they charge quite high rates for their their pensions under management, often quoted as 1.5%. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one because despite all of that bad publicity, and it's been relentless, every bank has pointed the finger at St. James's Place as being, you know, we're not as expensive as those guys. Um, they're an incredible success story. So I, I, it's, I, it kind of jumped out at me this morning. Um, amazing. There's clearly no such thing as bad PR. But also they've got great returns. Not being funny, if it works for the customers, they're going to stay. Quite simple as that. Thanks ever so much yeah. for that, Rupert. Couldn't agree more. Joe, what have you picked out? Pick of the punchlines. Um, so I wanted to pick out to talk about um, the reporter, John Hawkins, um, retiring. I think it's really sad. I think it's great for him that he's retiring, that he's, you know, worked extremely hard over many, many years and covered many national stories um but my own personal journey with john hawkins is i met him back in 2013 he wrote the very first report about me setting up the charity um three months before i set it up and i've still got the article from the gloucester review which is here wow. and it, it was just absolutely um, you know, he did so much writing this article for me. The amount of people that contacted me after they saw this article wanted to know what I was doing was absolutely phenomenal. And um, he wrote an amazing piece and really put me on a platform that, you know, I probably didn't appreciate what it was going to do, but it did. And I think um, he's a great reporter and I'm sure you know him very well, Mark. I do indeed, and um, I, he was very poorly recently, and it's great to see him back on his feet as well, and 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 retired. But we are going to miss him. There is a there is a big loss on the crime reporting that we all use locally, and it's very expensive and very skilled element of of uh, of that kind of side of things, really. Okay, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. I'd just like to thank you guys. Thanks ever so much for my wonderful panel for today. My my brilliant and amazing sponsors, Hayeswoods Accountants and Business Advisors. A really big thank you for watching. And remember, we'll be back again next week. So in the meantime, it's all in the punchline. Bye.